And some people think this world has had enough But no, 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 no. it's gonna be alright
So if you enjoy watching the programs we make at Spirit and Life, we have some great news for you. You can now join the Spirit and Life community online by downloading our brand new app. It's available on all iOS and Android devices. Just search for Spirit and Life Media and click to download. From there, you can link directly to our YouTube channels, watch historical programming, listen to free audio podcasts and music, contact us and other people within the community. You can watch our live streams with push notifications whenever we go live. There's even a free Bible study search tool, especially for you. And that's not all. Very soon you'll also be able to sign up to watch exclusive programming not available on any other platform. So again, just go to our iOS app store if you have an iPhone or an iPad, or Google Play if you have an Android device. Search for Spirit and Life Media. Click to download and you're good to go. The Spirit and Life app is waiting to serve you. Download it right now. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. In his new book, Anointer, Anointing, Anointed, God, the Holy Spirit, and You, Dr. Hugh Alexander Jackman unpacks the true and hidden meaning of the title, The Christ. Each rich chapter of this book will build your faith and confidence in the Word of God, Jesus, and His anointing. The message is for all who will hear the Word. Through a detailed and thought-provoking exegesis of the revelation of the Christ, Anointer, anointing, anointed. God, the Holy Spirit, and you is available now through Amazon Worldwide or directly by contacting Hugh Jackman Publishing at spiritandlife.org.uk. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Anointer, anointing, anointed. God, the Holy Spirit, and you. Good morning, everybody. God bless you, and welcome to daylight, half daylight, because we're not ready yet. The studio is not yet um, here, but it will arrive tomorrow by God's grace, and then uh, uh, we start the work of uh, setting up for next week. So welcome, anyway, to my humble uh, laptop <laughs> version. I hope you're well. Hope all is good for you this morning. Um, I'm doing well. Um, thank you for all of your messages and well wishes this morning. I'm doing very well. Um, had a wonderful time uh, yesterday over uh, with uh, brother Daniel Chand and uh, his uh, lovely wife, uh, Tanya, and the church over there. We had a wonderful time. Um, it was an evangelistic day. It was really, really wonderful. The Lord moved. It was awesome. We had a great time. I'm really enjoying being back in the UK and uh, and uh, hope that uh, 
I get to connect with more and more of you as the time goes by. So today I just want to spend, hopefully you can hear me, uh, I suppose you can, yes I think you can. Um, I know the sound isn't what it would normally be because um, I'm just using my laptop for the time being. Uh, next week things will get back to normal and uh, we'll have the broadcast set up as it normally or would have been ordinarily. But anyway, God bless you. Thanks for joining me anyway this morning. It's great to see you um, uh, from here in the little pad in the UK. And things are going just, just fine. Let me say some good mornings to you, as I like to do. Sue Milton's always first on. Bless you, Sue. Good to see you this morning. I'm trying to uh, get my <laughs> equipment to, to work with me today. It's kind of been a bit funny. Anita, good morning to you, Anita Killick. Bless you, good to, great to see you as always. I see you saying good morning to each other, that's nice. Adam, Adam uh, Grace, good morning to you, my brother. Bless you and great to see you and happy Sunday, you say. And I agree with you. Uh, Doc, God bless you, good to see you. Thanks for joining me so early. And uh, yeah, wonderful to see you. Um, uh, <laughs> you're all saying hello to each other, it's quite interesting. Uh, Anne, good morning to you over there in Ireland. How are you? Hope you're well and uh, bless you. Great to see you. Um, Lisa, good morning to you and uh, bless you. We got, I think we got cut off the other day. We'll finish our conversation soon. Carrie, how are you? Thinking about you this morning, uh, kind of thinking about the message uh, that I have to preach today and uh, you came into my mind, so you'll see why later on. Jennifer, good morning to you, and God bless you, good to see you. My dear uh, Sharon, good morning to you, and uh, God bless you, thanks for joining me this morning. Rev Cole, how are you doing? Bless you, man, you and the wife. I send greetings and love to you both, and pray all is well with you. All right, bless you. Oh, we've got some emails coming through. Let's just turn off the email account for the time being. Just one of those things. Joyce, good morning to you and God bless you. Great to see you. And uh, it's wonderful as always uh, to have you on the broadcast. Glossina, how are you? Good to see you. Again, I was thinking about you uh, uh, recently. So it's great, great, great to see you. Bless you. Uh, Rita, good morning to you, Auntie. I hear you've been globe trotting. Bless you. Good to see you, uh, Sandra Knight. Good morning to you. How are you? God bless you, uh, Anna Williams. Good morning to you, and God bless you. And you say blessed first day of May. Long may it continue. Pardon the pun. I kind of know what you mean by that. Uh, bless you. Uh, Helen, good morning to you, and God bless you this morning. Uh, praise the Lord. It's great to have you on. And uh, Elaine, good morning to you, and God bless you. Uh, Wilma, good morning to you, and God bless you. Praise God. And Bart, good morning to you, and God bless you. Um, and Elaine, you say you've got rain in Wales. <laughs> Listen, I feel like um, I feel like we, we're coming into a new season at this moment in time. I don't know how you, you are perceiving things, but I feel like we're coming into a new season. Um, and so um, I'll talk a bit about that in just a moment. Morning to you, Brother Wayne, uh, son-in-law, and also Claire, good morning to you. And you say good morning to the team as well. All right. Blessings, everybody. Thank you for joining me, as always. And um, today's one of those days, as I say, just to repeat, I'm just on the laptop until next week. The studio should arrive tomorrow, by God's grace, and uh, we start setting up the studio. So for now, um, excuse the picture. I hope it's okay. I hope the sound is okay. As I say, it's just the laptop. But praise God. Um, the word can still go forward, that's what's important. And if I can share a word uh, this morning with everybody that, that the Lord would have me to preach, then who cares? 
if it's on a laptop or not. All right, good morning to the Radio Reverend. I must say good morning to my good friend John Leach. have to do that, otherwise I won't feel myself. Glad that you were able to find the broadcast this morning. Johnny, bless you, man. It's great to have you on board. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you thanks and give you praise, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that um, I don't have to worry about this message, whether I have it complete or not, because it doesn't matter. What matters is that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so I thank you this morning, Lord, that your Spirit is with me. Oh, hallelujah. Just, just the utterance of those words lifts my spirit and helps me to uh, now begin to flow with that Spirit, with the Spirit of God. And so this morning, Father, I thank you that your Spirit is with me. And because your Spirit is with me, I'm going to open my mouth and there'll be less of me and there'll be more of you. I'll open my mouth and there'll be none of me and it will be all of you. And that you will minister to your children and take them to the throne of God this morning and encourage their hearts. Take us to a new place of victory, a new place of, of confidence in you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Morning to everybody this morning. Whatever you may be going through this morning, there is an answer, and that answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only is he the answer, he's also going to give us wisdom. You know that the Spirit of God is still speaking today. We are not cessationists. We believe that the Spirit of God is still speaking, that he speaks into our lives on a daily basis. Do you expect to hear from God on a daily basis? We should because the Spirit of God is with us. And if the Spirit of God lives and dwells on the inside of you, he's going to speak. But I believe that the, the reason why we don't hear his voice is because we don't. I don't think sometimes that we are, uh, let's say, polite to him. He's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And uh, if we're polite to him, he'll always be polite back. Isn't that something so, so basic and simple? that if we would be polite to the Holy Spirit, he will always be polite and speak back to us. Maybe we start our days by just getting straight to the breakfast table or straight to doing whatever we're doing. We haven't been polite enough just to say good morning to the Holy Spirit. Remember Benny Hinn wrote that book years ago, Good Morning Holy Spirit, thank you for being in my life. It's amazing how just when we begin to pray, just when we begin to to just acknowledge his, his presence, he immediately, I mean, it doesn't take 10 seconds, it doesn't take five seconds, he immediately comes into our lives. He immediately manifests himself. It doesn't even, it, it, it's not even a split second. His presence is all we need. I used to always, at one point in my development, you know, we go through different phases in our development and in our walks with Christ, and at one point in my development and in my walk, I used to always pray with a prayer shawl because um, I found something out about the prayer shawls. The, I'm talking about the prayer shawl from Israel. And I found out that the prayer shawl is an amplifier of God's presence. I kind of found that out. And I found it out kind of by happenstance one day. I was praying, put the prayer shawl on. Bang! I said, whoa, God's presence. I felt his presence so quickly. And then, of course, I realized that maybe it wasn't the prayer shawl. I think the prayer shawl is an amplifier of God's presence. But there are some amplifiers of God's presence that you don't need to put anything on. The amplifier of God's presence is actually on the inside of you. Amen. And so the reason why sometimes, let me rephrase that. I didn't say that very well. The reason why sometimes a prayer shawl and things like that can amplify God's presence and bring us quick, more quicker into his presence when we're praying or something like that more quickly is because we put a lot of faith in things. We put a lot of our faith in things and sometimes we need a point of contact for our faith to kind of connect with. But I want to talk to you today about something that is on the inside of us that we can touch all the time every single day, on a daily basis. And this thing that is on the inside of us is God's presence. 
And I hate to call God's presence a thing, but that's just a descriptive thing. I'm just doing my opening gambit, if you like, to give you an idea of where I felt that the Holy Spirit was taking us this week. Uh, all week, I've been thinking about a scripture, and uh, when I read the scripture, uh, I just was meditating on it because a lot of people preach from a particular scripture, which basically says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And uh, I've been thinking on that all week because I don't know about you, but as you wake up in the morning, have you noticed that the enemy, that is Satan, the devil, the deceiver, will on a daily basis make attempts uh, to, uh, to change the way you think in your heart? I've noticed that on a daily basis, as I wake up, um, the news media, um, whether it's the news or whether it's the YouTube or whatever it may be, or maybe just people contacting me, but the enemy seems to try to come in on a daily basis, you know, with negativity, negative thoughts. And sometimes it's just a fear. Sometimes it's a fear about things. Sometimes it's, you know, fear of how you're going to pay bills. Sometimes it's fear of your job whatever it may be, but I've noticed that, and especially I've noticed this since I've come back to the UK, that on a daily basis, as I wake up in the UK, um, I have I have certain challenges to overcome on a daily basis. I notice that the minute I open my eyes, they're there, they're just trying to uh, suffocate my self-image. And... Uh, I guess the reason why I wanted to do this program this morning is because I found something out with every day of this week that went by when those challenges would try to come on me, I found out that you can actually combat those thoughts with another thought. You can combat those thoughts with a very, very simple uh, thought that emanates from the inside. It emanates from the Holy Spirit that is dwelling and living on the inside of us. And um, so I wanted to maybe use as my foundation this morning um, a scripture from 2 Corinthians. Yeah, a scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 7 and just share some thoughts about this that I think will help us this morning to overcome. How do we overcome those thoughts of the enemy that will try to envelop us on a daily, daily basis? Who wants to hear this message today? How do we overcome? And I just want to say to start with that, um, it's been really good for me to come back to the UK because um, oftentimes, you know, for the last couple of years, obviously we've been through the pandemic, we've been through now we're going through European war and things like that. And I've realized something that um, I was kind of very sheltered uh, in Spain, just myself, Siva, in the apartment, very sheltered, cut off from the world. Um, and it was been great because I've been able to do some great things. So I've been able to produce some great music, write some books, and it's been great. But it came to a point where I realized that I was actually quite cut off from you guys, from the world, from the church. Um, and since coming back to the UK, it's been great for me because I've been able to reconnect and be just that ability to look into people's eyes again and to have fellowship, to talk, and to realize that the image, come on somebody, that I've built up on the inside the last two years of constantly being here on a Sunday morning was building up an image of the Word of God on the inside of me. And, and I think in some of you as well, and that image that has been built up on the inside of me, now I get an opportunity to walk that image out, to actually uh, be in the world, to be part, to go out in churches, to lay hands on the sick like we were doing yesterday and praying for folk and seeing uh, the effect again. It's been amazing. And I want to say that it is the self-image that God has put on the inside of me and on the inside of you that I am now walking out 
that self-image. So we spend weeks and weeks and weeks and months sharing the Word of God and building up our faith to the place where we are ready uh, to step back out into the world. And I want to prophesy over you today, today um, that it's okay for you to step outside, back, go back and do, begin to do things that you used to do before. The Spirit of the Lord is with you. He will protect you. He will keep you. He'll keep any harm from coming to you. I prophesy over you that you shall not be, you shall not uh, be sick. You shall be well. In Jesus' name, I prophesy over you that the Spirit of the Lord is with you. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. And I want to say that to you today, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I think that really, really came home to me last week when I was at a boxing match where there was 95,000 people and there I was walking among those 95,000 people. But I just felt the whole time that there was a shield of protection around me. Come on, somebody, a shield of protection. As you go out, as you go out today, as you go do whatever you do, I declare over you that there is a shield of protection around you, that there is a fence around you. How can I say this? Because I'll tell you something, there is an inner image that is on the inside of me that I cannot shake, wouldn't want to shake, even if I could. There is an inner image on the inside of me that has been, been built, building up for the last two years in these daylight programs. And now that image is being manifest as I walk through this world and walk in the UK and carry out that which God has me to do. Take a look at... Um, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7. I'm probably going to read uh, right through to uh, verse 17. All right. I just want to show a bit of, we're really going for the latter part of this scripture, but I thought, let me just read the whole thing. Maybe the Spirit of God will reveal some things to us as we go along. So let's jump in with the iPad. It says, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Let's break there for a second and let's understand something. This is really interesting. This uh, scripture, in this particular scripture, in the book of Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul calls the law the ministry of death. That's so interesting when you look at that. He calls the law the ministry of death. He said it was written and engraved on stone, so we know that that is the law, the uh, law that came through Moses. But it says that it was glorious. There was a ministry of death that was actually glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses. So imagine this, a ministry of death written, that's the law, uh, but it was, even though it was the law and it was the ministry of death, it was glorious, so much so, that Moses, having seen uh, God, had a countenance of glory on himself uh, that the children of Israel were not able to look at. Come on, somebody. He, he had been so affected. That you, you hear where I'm going with this? He had been so affected by this presence of God that he had uh, been in front of that he had received, that he had been before, that his very physical nature was affected so that there was a glow that was coming off of him, a glow, a glory that was coming off of Moses. And he goes on to say this glory was passing away, but it was so glorious that people couldn't look at it. Man alive, uh, if we can get a hold of this, my brothers and sisters this morning, it will really uh, bless us to understand the power of God's word. Now, how will, he says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Let's stop and meditate on that for a second. So this ministry of death, which was written and engraved on stones, was glorious, that they could not even look at that countenance. He goes on to say, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? I prophesy over you and speak over you this morning, that if you have received the spirit of grace, the spirit of the Lord on the inside of you, it is more glorious 
than that, uh, come on somebody, than that countenance, that glow, that glory that was on Mo Moses. Come on, come on somebody. The ministry of the Spirit is more glorious even than the uh, ministry or the uh, countenance, the glory of the ministry that was upon Moses in those days. Hallelujah. For if the con ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Let's talk about that for a second. If the ministry, if the ministry of condemnation, morning to you, Mama Chi, morning to you, God bless you, my good friend. If the ministry, do you, are you reading this with me? If the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. We have to really grasp and try to understand these scriptures because they will give us so much to understand, okay? The ministry of condemnation had some glory. The ministry of condemnation, the law, had some glory. It was so glorious that the man had to physically cover his face. Hmm? Yeah, interesting. Some say that perhaps he covered his face, face because the glory was passing away. Um, in other words, the glory was not, maybe it's telling us that the glory was not uh, in the natural, was, was not, was kind of passing away. It wasn't in the natural. I don't want to say it one way or the other. However you want to see it, it could be that. That glory was passing away. It wasn't so glorious as it used to be. So the veil was there. I think I heard somebody preach that once. You know, that the people would not get offended. You know, cover his face. Because the glory was passing away. I don't know. Maybe you read it however you want to read it. But the fact is there was glory. At one point there was glory. But he's saying that this ministry of the Spirit will be more glorious for the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. What is the ministry of righteousness? The ministry of righteousness is the fact that we have received our righteousness through the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Not through anything that you and I can do or have the ability to do, but that his presence alone in our lives has made us righteous. His righteousness emanates from his presence and you and I are righteous through him. This is my thought on every single day of my life at the moment when I think about his righteousness. It makes me smile on the inside. There is an inner image that's being formed and being transformed into his righteousness, not through any of my own deeds, but simply by the reception of his son the Son of God, by the reception of the Holy Spirit in my life. It goes on to say, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, this is interesting. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So that veil that was hiding the countenance of Moses, hiding the countenance, really the glory, not allowing us to see the glory of God, is now taken away. When does it get taken away? When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. 
So when you and I turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And I'll talk about another veil in a minute. The, the, I believe the, the greater veil, which is the veil which stood between the holy place and the holy of holies, where the presence of the Lord was, the glory of the Lord was, that veil is equally taken away. The veil that was eight inches thick and stopped us from going into his presence. Now in verse 17, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. Come on, somebody. From glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Let me read that again. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I believe that with every day that passes and every single time, our self-image is being challenged by, I believe, the enemy who tries to place a veil again on our hearts. We have to keep looking at the countenance of the Lord Jesus. We have to keep looking at the Spirit of the Lord, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I don't know about you, but I've been experiencing this on a daily basis, where when challenges and worries come in, I immediately begin to look to that image on the inside of me, and I'm being transformed by that image. I think that we get to a place in our lives as we walk through as Christians, where, and especially in these times, in, in these days of the passing pandemic and so on, I say passing because I just have a sense in my spirit that the pandemic is passing now. We have, we have passed it. It's we have gone past it. It's not going to come up again. The Spirit of the Lord uh, is working throughout the earth. And I believe that the purpose of the pandemic, it has actually uh, produced what it needed to produce. And here's the strange thing. I believe that the primary purpose of what we've been through is for the church to come to a place of the knowledge of who and what we are in Christ, so that we can be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the world. And so in this time and in this season, I am on a daily basis uh, looking at that image. And, you know, I want to say something that what I think one of the things that grace does for us, understanding the grace of the Lord, is that before we understand his grace, there is actually a veil on us. But it's working in the reverse way. The veil is basically not allowing us to look at God's presence. Now, what, what is that veil? The veil is basically the flesh. The veil is sin. The veil is, is anything that is taking away our confidence to look into the face of God. Anything that's taking us away, that's not allowing us to uh, present ourselves before God. And that's why I believe when, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm on, what should I do here? I'm trying to get to, oh, I use two fingers, that's it. And that's why when um, uh, in verse 8, the Apostle Paul was talking, he says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, he says, how much more? The ministry of righteousness exceed much more in glory. Now, the ministry of righteousness is the ministry that says it doesn't matter 
what you do or how you do it. It doesn't matter uh, how good your deeds are. It doesn't matter how much effort you put in. It doesn't matter about those things. What it matters or what matters is that we know the one who has, through his deeds and through his efforts, brought us this righteousness that we didn't deserve. And so we're no longer looking to try to exceed in our own righteousness, but now we are looking to the righteousness that exceeds, and that is the righteousness of Christ. So I was thinking, how do we put this into some words? And so I put some thoughts together as usual that I can share with you today. And please, again, for those of you who are catching me today, remember, I'm not back in the studio. I'm just putting some thoughts together uh, today, last week and this, today. Um, so I'm not quite where I normally am in terms of my organization. But let's just see where the Spirit of the Lord takes us in this word. Um, and also, everything's not in the usual place, so just bear with me. I want to say this as a starting point this morning. How do we transform our self-image? Or rather, how do we, uh, through looking at the face of Christ, at the Holy Spirit, how does our self-image change? And this is a huge and very important question. And I want to show you this slide here from my iPad. Knowing the reality of the Father's love will radically transform your inner image. Knowing the reality of the Father's love will radically transform your inner or your self-image. I think this is a huge point, and it's one, again, that I, I know I sound a bit like a broken record, but it's okay to sound like this broken record, because this revelation of the Father's love in my life and in your life is literally the thing that transforms everything about our lives and about our ministries. For example, if the devil attacks you in your body or in your mind or wherever he may attack you, the knowing the reality of the Father's love will radically transform your inner image because you know that he loves you. You know 100%. There is no doubt. No doubt whatsoever that his love belongs to you, that he's given you his love, that he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. There is no more powerful message than that. None. And if we know that as a reality in our lives, when the devil tries to put sickness and disease upon us, it is answered by the reality of that knowledge that we have on the inside of us. And it radically transforms our inner image. Now, when our inner image is transformed, it won't be long before our outer image begins to follow. There was a woman in the scripture, uh, I think I'll turn there. There was a woman um, who, let me see if I can find the scripture. You guys, like I say, just bear with me while I <laughs> work a little bit differently at the moment. So, But next week I'll be back to normal. Everything will be as it usually is. But I have to search on a different system to find scriptures now. Let's go here. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Yeah, here we go. In Mark 5, 27, this woman who heard about Jesus... Has, let me put it up on screen. Yeah. She heard about Jesus. She came behind him in the crowd 
and touched his garment. And notice what she did. For she said, and I think the Amplified says, she said within herself, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the Bible says the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And so I want to just say this morning that this woman, she had a condition that had kept her ill for 12 years, I believe. 12 years. She couldn't stop this bleeding from happening. But she had a thought on the inside of her. And the thought was, if I could just touch his clothes, actually, um, this reference, I'm pretty sure uh, if I went into another version, I could show you that uh, what she actually touched was the hem of his garment, the um, probably the zitzit, which is the tassel that hangs down from the priest's garment which represents the word of God, by the way, and that she touched this zitzit, the, the hem of his garment, because she said within herself, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Now, her inner image was getting ready to transform her outer image just by touching the hem of his garment. And I believe with all my heart that the inner image, inner image that we carry is getting ready to change our outer image. And the interesting thing is that if you read on the story, that the Lord was walking, and as she touched his garment, he turned around in the press, in the crowd, and he said, who touched me? Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. And the Bible says that the woman now in fear, let me turn there. Let's read it a bit. Mark 5.27. Mark 5.27. Let's get that. Let's read it a little bit. Mark chapter 5.27. Sorry about the delay here a little bit. When she came, heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him. This is what I wanted you to see. He immediately knew in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? So you see, my friends, it's an automatic thing. When you get the, it, come on somebody, when you get the inner image right, when your inner image is the image that God wants you to have, then it's an automatic thing. Look at this. Do you know, it's interesting. The Lord says, who touched me? In other words, help me, help me to say this, Holy Spirit. It's not a question at this point of whether, let me say it right. It's not a question of whether the Lord is willing to heal the woman or not. It's not a question of whether the Lord is willing to heal this woman or not. This woman has an image on the inside of her, which she has gotten from hearing about Jesus. Now, we have an image on the inside of us, which we get by hearing the word of grace. The image that we have on the inside of us is that the Lord is our healer. The Lord loves us. The Spirit of God lives and dwells on the inside of us, and his love lives and dwells on the inside of us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is, he's, listen, he's, you, you could never be more loved at this present moment than you are right now. You are completed in him. He's complete in you. You abide in him. He abides in you. You ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. The spirit of the Lord is liberty and liberty is living on the inside of you. These are the images that we should have and should be nurturing on the inside of us. And so, listen, you talk about provision. The provision of God is on the inside of you. Lack, the provision of God is inside of you. Poverty, the provision of God is inside of you. Every area of our lives that we are challenged by, there is an answer. 
And the answer comes from that self-image. We need to be like this woman and say, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Well, you and I have been made whole by the presence of God on the inside of us. And this is what the Lord says. He says, who touched my clothes? In other words, there is no resistance as far as the Lord Jesus is concerned. If the, Listen, there is no resistance as far as Jesus is concerned in the area of giving you what his word has already provided for you. There is no resistance. He cannot stop it. If you get the right image on the inside of you, he cannot stop but allow his power to flow. It's an automatic thing. If the image is right, the power will flow. So somebody said, what's the image? How does the image get right? Hey, let me show you this. Look at this. Uh, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, I think it's 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. Look at this. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. I believe this scripture is giving us an idea of what that self-image is. What, uh, by the way, let's show you something. Throughout the whole earth, James, whose heart is loyal to him. Look at this. I've shown you this before, but look at it again. The one whose heart is loyal to him, the word there is shalem. Shalem. I've shown you this before. It means, listen, made ready, peaceable, perfect, quiet. Made ready, peaceable, perfect, quiet is where we get the word shalom from. So the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the one whose heart is at peace with him. The one whose heart, not loyal, loyal is an English translation, is the one who has shalem with God, who has shalom with God. Come on, somebody, there's only one way to be at peace with God. And that is to accept the grace of God in your life. To accept the fact that he loves you with an undying love. That you could not possibly be more loved than you are at this present time. So when the thoughts come in, when the fears come in, yes, Helen, I think I heard you say that a minute ago, that perfect love casts out fear. Who said that? Helen Yakulas. Perfect love casts out fear. So when we know that his love in us is perfected, I want to tell you something. This is, this is really a new thing for me. You know, I, I, I've, I've come to a new place in my own life where his love has become, God's love has become the paramount thing that's working in my life. You know, the Bible says faith works by love. But I always used to put love to the back. I wanted to see the power of God. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want to see, I, I want to see the prophetic operating at a higher level. I want to see the supernatural levels of God. I want to see the wisdom of God. I want to see all of these things. And so for me, the love was never something that I focused on. The love was never something that I really, really got a grasp of. But my Lord in heaven, now I've begun to understand that the true, true, true fuel, the fuel of our real power, the fuel of our prophetic gifting, the fuel of our walk, our glorious walk in Christ, the fuel of our victories in this world, the fuel of all the, of our financial blessing, the fuel of all these things is the love of God. The love of God. By simply knowing the love of God, our self-image is transformed. We're transformed into the image of the one who lives and dwells on the inside of us. Uh, do not alter your self-image by worrying. Let's look at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 and 26. Matthew 6, 
verse 25 and 26. Are you ready for this? Do not alter your self-image. Mm. I like that. Anna Williams, because of his grace, I am eternally grateful because he has chosen me and I received and accepted him before the foundation of the world. Amen to that, my sister. Listen to this. And therefore, I say to you, do not worry about... Oh, I haven't put it up. Sorry, like I said, I'm not used to this other system. Do not alter your, your inner image by worrying. This is the words of the Lord Jesus. This is what he said. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, not about your body. Uh, I'm sorry, I just need to do something real quick. Bring something up on the screen. Bear with me a second. Sorry, I'll read on in just a moment. I'd lost uh, something important. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I believe the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is showing us through this scripture when the Lord Jesus walked on the earth and he said these words. He seemed to, he seemed to uh, believe and want us to understand that there is something very, very, very important, something extremely important about this thing called worrying, that when we worry about things, and this is what I'm saying on a daily basis, I have been experiencing this where worry tries to come up in my life, worry over this, worry over that, worry over so many things, worry over finances, worries, 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 okay? And then this scripture comes to me do not worry about the thing do not worry about your life don't worry about anything it's telling me that worry is one of those things that will cancel or affect or what's a better word worry will distort your inner image what image inner image am i talking about the image i was just describing to you that you are loved of god that he lives and dwells on the inside of you. You are a son of God, a daughter of God. His presence lives and dwells with you. His best is that we walk every single day in his presence and that he is willing to show himself strong constantly, all the time in our behalf because he loves us. There is no lack of love in God's heart for me. That even if I failed, even if I messed up, his grace tells me he's still walking with me. I will never let go of that image as long as I walk in the earth, in planet earth. I will never let go of that inner image, the image of a loving father dwelling and living on the inside of me. Amen. And if I start to worry what I'm saying is, I'm giving up that image. If I start to worry about stuff, I'm laying that image aside and I'm replacing that image with another image, which is an image that God really can't take care of my circumstances. He can't help me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, actually, the, the foundation scripture for this like I said, that I was really going to speak on was a scripture from the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 6. And, and it's one that I've heard people speak about a lot. And I wanted to read it. And I'm going to read it to you now. But I'm going to read it in context because it says much more than what I thought it said. How many know context is very important when it comes to... Uh, the word of God. Context is very, very important. So a lot of people kind of take this out of context and it still works. Yeah, you can take the word of God sometimes out of context and as long as the heart of God is in what you are presenting, it will still work. But this one we're going to take out of context and in context because I think it will benefit us more to see it both ways, okay? 
So Proverbs 23, verse 6 to 8. Proverbs 23, 6 to 8. Proverbs 23, 6 to 8. Let's take a look at that. Proverbs 23, 6 to 8. There's a powerful message hidden in these words. Bang. Eat not the bread of him who has a hard, grudging, and envious eye. Neither desire his dainty foods, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As one who reckons, he says to you, eat and drink, yet his heart is not with you, but is grudging the cost. This is from the Amplified Version. The morsel which you have eaten you will vomit out, and your complimentary words will be wasted. Now, I read that whole thing really to focus on chapter on verse 7 but I thought while I do that I'll just break down a little bit of what it means in context but this is one of those scriptures that you can take out of context and it still works but let's just show you how the context in context it helps us to understand something about the power of the human heart and how our self-image can affect not only us, but also others. You see, this scripture is saying, you should not eat the bread of him who has a hard, grudging, and envious heart. Or even another scripture put it this way, don't eat the bread of a miser. Don't eat the bread of a miser. If somebody has a miserly spirit and they want to provide for you, they're providing for you, but they're not really, pro listen, they're not doing it out of a true heart, out of a loving heart. They're a miser. They're not doing it because they want to see you blessed. They're just doing it. They're really grudging what it's costing them. That's what it's explaining. And it says, don't eat that bread because as a man thinks, watch this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you eat the bread from that person, it's explaining that even the morsel which you've eaten, you'll end up vomiting it up. Now, what is that saying to you? This is deep, but stay with me. It's saying that this scripture that says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It means that everything that that man does is affected, come on somebody, by the way he thinks in his heart. So even the one who provides you a piece of bread, but provides it with a measly spirit, that provision that he's given to you is actually having an effect even on the bread it's actually having an effect even on the person who's eating that bread. Now, if we take that scripture and work it in the reverse, you know, we, we um, uh, dissect it and look at it in terms of, in terms of, what's the word I usually use? We break it down. We um, reverse engineer it. That's the phrase I was looking for then what it actually tells us is that that self-image that we carry, come on somebody, not only affects us, but it affects others. The self-image that we carry, the self-image that we are able to walk in is not only going to have an effect on our lives, but it's also going to affect others. Yesterday I was in a meeting where, um, as I said, I was over with Daniel Chand and, and Tanya Chand over at their church. And there were many people who came for prayer. And I was standing there and I've had this thought many times over the years, but I was having a different conversation with God in my heart. The conversation I was having with God on this occasion, in the past I would be thinking, Lord, when I lay hands on this one, let your presence come on this one. Let this one be healed. Lord, when I lay hands on this one, when I pray for that one, let something happen in their life. But yesterday my, my conversation with God was different. You see, as I stood there, I was remembering myself, my inner image. 
I was remembering the fact that he has promised me. It's not about me asking him to do it. I was remembering the fact that God is within, within me. I was remembering the fact that his grace has washed me clean from top of the head to the sole of my feet. There is nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing required. At that moment in time, I stand as a representative of the Spirit of God. And when I lay hands on people, it was not a question of whether people will be touched. It is not a question of whether people will be healed. It was a reality that people will be touched. It was a reality that people will be healed. And I didn't even need to hear a testimony because I have the word of God. I am assured by his word that those that I pray for will be healed in Jesus' name. Let me take a moment right now. You're sick in your body or you're going through something right now. You've been going through it for a long time. I tap right now in the name of Jesus into the image of Christ that dwells on the inside of me. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I speak over your life healing from the throne of heaven. I speak over your life healing in the mighty name of Jesus. What am I basing that on? The Bible says, if there be any sick among you, let them call the elders of the church and anointing them with oil. But I can't get to anointing with oil, but I am an elder. And it says that the prayer uh, uh, that I pray will raise up the sick. And so this morning, I'm declaring over you healing in the mighty name of Jesus. And I don't have to worry about whether that prayer is going to work or not because I know I have the image of Christ on the inside of me. His anointing lives and dwells on the inside of me. I am fully persuaded that that which I have said will come to pass. And so I declare you healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And all you need to say is amen. All you need to say is, you know what? Today I touch the hem of his garment and I receive the word of God. Ooh, who said that? I like that. Mama Chi said, we are ambassadors for Christ. This is so true. Ambassadors for the kingdom of God. And as ambassadors, you know what ambassadors are? Ambassadors live in one world, in one country, but they actually represent another country. And so we live in this world, but we actually represent the kingdom of God. And as representatives of the kingdom of God, we can speak that which the kingdom has declared to us. Listen, are you hearing? So did you get that? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that thinking, did you get what I was saying? It's not just, it's not just how the one is affected by his thinking. The scripture is telling you that if you eat the bread from that one, it will affect you as well. And so, conversely speaking, as I think in my heart, I now, through the Lord Jesus Christ, have the ability to affect you with my words and with my prayers. You have the ability to receive from me. Why? Because my self-image is a God self-image, not a man self-image, but a God self-image. All the glory goes to Jesus. I can do nothing of myself. It's not about me. It's all about him. And when we realize that, things change. I want to say to you on a daily basis, when you wake up in the morning now, when thoughts and fears begin to come to you, remember what Helen said. Perfect love casts out fear. Knowing that you are loved, knowing that the presence of God is with you, it's going to transform your mind, your thinking, and your self-image. And now you're going to begin to think of yourself differently. 
because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And as you think of yourself differently, you will have an effect on others. Let me say this to you. You're having conditions and situations at your workplace as you think in your heart. It's going to affect people around you. But you, we, listen, we've got to, on a daily basis, on a daily basis, some of you are hearing me, some of you are not, but those who are hearing me, listen to me very carefully. You have an anti-image that's trying to be presented to you every single day. An anti-image that's trying to tell you the opposite of what this true self-image is. The image of Christ on the inside of you. That you're being transformed into on a daily basis. There is, a, there is another voice that's trying to tell you on a daily basis. No, 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 no. That's not the image. That's not the image. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. Who are we? What is my self-image? Come on, somebody. Am I a servant or a son? Am I a victim or a victor? Am I blessed or am I cursed? Am I forgiven or am I frustrated? Am I saved or am I a sinner? These are important questions we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis because as a man thinks in his heart, or a woman thinks in her heart, so is he or she. I've got a big statement to say to you this morning, and it's the words of the Lord Jesus. He said something about our self-image that is going to be tough for a lot of people to receive. Because a lot of people will receive this in a religious sense. But they won't be able to receive this the way God wants us to. Must we really, really, really receive this the way Christ wants us to receive it. We're going to get lost in the statement. But hang in there with me and look at it together. Let's look at what the Lord Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. Listen to what he said. John, chapter 10, 34 to 36. And ask yourself, is this the image that Christ wants me to have? Here we go. Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Now I noticed that Mama Chi, you wrote this word here just now, I am a son. It's interesting because you didn't know I was going to bring this scripture here. I said, you are gods. And if you called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Is it possible that the Lord Jesus is attempting to show the people of the time? And by the way, Let's go back to what we read earlier on. Let me see if I can find it. Remember, just keep that scripture in your spirit. But remember what the Lord, what we saw earlier on in the scripture. That talked about the law and that there was some glory in the law, but that the ministry, where was it? Let me see if I can find it. I'll bring you back to that in just a second. It's, I just need you to see this again. It's important. I'm going back. Here we go. Let's come back to here. Watch. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel, the children of Israel, 
The children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So he's referring here, or here, I should say, to the ministry of death, that is the law, written and engraved on stones. And he says it was glorious. But do you see now, he says, in the law, which is what? The ministry of death that was written on stones. He said, in that law, he said, I say you are gods. And if he called them gods whom the word, word of God came, the scripture cannot be broken. And what's Brother Hugh saying to you this morning? That you should go around thinking that you're God? Well, I think what the Spirit of God wants us to do is he wants us to understand that our image is that we are certainly connected with the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of God lives and dwells on the inside of us. And certainly that in terms of our our existence in this world, we are overlords over the things of this life. You got more power over sickness than you know. You got more power over mental issues than you know. You have more power over your conditions and situations than you know. He wants you to be walking. Hey, let me show you this. Let me let, let's go to the um, the scripture that he quoted there. Look at this, Psalms 82. So the Lord Jesus was quoting Psalm 82, right? God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. In other words, stop and think about that. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods. And all, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now, look at this scripture from Psalm 82. It seems clear that this is the scripture that the Lord Jesus was quoting. And he was explaining to them that even though I have made you, because the word of God has come to you, I have made you, as gods in the earth. Small g, not capital, but I've made you like gods in the earth. You know, that's the reason why when you lay hands on sick people, they can be recovered because he's made you like a god in the earth. You know that all of the work of Satan, all of the work of Satan in your life, you are God over that. You're God over him and you're God over all of his works. The Bible declares that he's supposed to be under our feet because you, he has made you like a son of God and you are God over all of those things that Satan wants to do to us. You're God over it. And I tell you, we, he's warning, in a sense warning us in the same way as he was warning the children of Israel. You're all children of the Most High. You're gods. But, he, but you shall die like men. And you shall fall like one of the princes. Why? Because we didn't accept the self-image that God wants us to have. I know that's heavy. I know that's heavy. But just think about how you have allowed certain six situations and circumstances to become God over you. Just think about it. Let the Lord, the Spirit of God, bring those situations up so you can see them. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Psalm 
excuse me, it's not about having some kind of inflated self-image that doesn't match with the scriptures and doesn't match with the spirit of God. It's not about us all going up into a community somewhere and topping ourselves. It's not about some crazy, crazy thought pattern led by some crazy despotic leader. This is about the presence of the spirit of God on the inside of us and the severity with which he deals with the devil if we believe it and the severity with which he deals with those who come against us if we believe it and it must only come through you and I accepting and understanding that there is an image on the inside of us that God wants us to walk in these words are important because your self-image will affect the way you pray. Your self-image will affect the way you walk. Have you ever had a struggle with a certain sin? <clears throat> Do you know that? Your self-image and how you see yourself will affect the way you treat yourself. You know, you, you treat a king a certain way. You see yourself as a son of a king, you will treat yourself differently. You treat, your self-image will affect the way you respond to circumstances in this world. And so you and I today are affected by our self-image. We're changed radically changed by that self-image. I have one more slide to show you. One more, one more slide. And I want to bring it back to a simple word. This is the word that completely transforms our self-image and lets us know without a shadow of a doubt why we have victory and why we walk in victory. The image of the knowledge of the fact that you are loved of God. I cannot stress this enough. Because look, hell's campaign was launched from the moment you became self-aware of his love. I told you that I had a vision in the beginning of this year when the I was when the Spirit of God said to me, Look to my grace. And when you look into his grace, it's not just about, you know, people have this weird concept of what grace is. And it's unbiblical to, it's to just only have an image of grace being something that means that if you sin, you're forgiven. Actually, that's not even grace, that's mercy. Really, it's more mercy. Grace is about you receiving what you did not deserve mercy is about you not receiving what you did deserve so if you go and do something and you know that you deserve punishment for it or whatever it might be if that's in your mindset then you go to God and you cry for mercy that's not what grace is about grace has so much greater connotations grace is about his righteousness it's about the free gift of righteousness living and dwelling on the inside of us. And through that free gift of righteousness, you and I, having the ability to have our lives transformed in ways that we could not perceive before. Not because somebody laid hands on us, or because somebody went to church and somebody prophesied over us, but simply because his presence lives and dwells on the inside of us. This is what I'm talking about. This is the gospel the gospel of grace. And from that gospel of grace flows a self-image that is unswervable. It's unrockable. No matter who says what to you, no matter how they come at you, no matter what is said to you, the one thing they cannot take away from you is this image of his love in your life. It can't be, it's unrockable. 
Do you get it? It's unrockable, unswervable, undefatigable, <laughs> undefeatable. It is total and complete. You can't mess with it. And no one can take away this gift of his love from you. No one. No, uh, no beings or things above the earth, nor beings or things beneath the earth, neither things nor beings within the earth. There is nothing inside this realm, outside this realm, nothing in the cosmos, nothing anywhere in the universe that can remove the love of God. The Apostle Paul put it like this. Um, maybe I, I'd have to get the scripture to quote it properly. He said, nothing can separate me. Come on, let's look at that scripture together as a final scripture. Nothing can separate me from his love. Nothing. There you go. Did you just put it up there, Helen? Nothing can separate me from the love of God. I never would have thought that. I never would have thought that the love of God could have such an effect on my life. It just, he's blown my mind with it. Because I, it wasn't what I thought. <laughs> it's like what I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for power. I signed up for glory. I signed up for anointing. I signed up for wisdom. I signed up for peace of mind. I came to God. I signed up for all these things. And the answer to all those things is, here, son, have my grace and have my love. You're watching me this morning, you don't know the love of God. You've never made, you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never called him your, you've never called him Lord, but you want to. I want to pray for you today. I had a lady ring me this week. She'd heard one of my songs. She'd heard a song called Don't Give Up. And she called me during the week. I won't say her name. She might be watching. And God bless this woman. She called me this week and she said, would you pray with me? Because I'm in a situation, a circumstance. It was amazing to me to think that this record called Don't Give Up Open the door. I should play it. Open the door for this woman. She changed her thinking. And she knew somehow that this record, this song, was written by somebody who could help her. And so she asked me to pray. If this, she didn't say to pray. She called and said, you know, can you help me or something like that? And I said, well, all I can do is pray. She said, please, yes, pray for me. So I prayed for her and then I led her to the Lord and she gave her life to Jesus. And I know from that second onwards, I knew that although I cannot get physically to where this woman is, she was in another country, I cannot physically reach her to help her. But I knew that from the very second that she prayed those words with me, that the presence of God has now come to dwell on the inside of her. Her self-image now began to change. She began to believe that the things she was praying about, that the things she was asking for, that it could change. And guess what? It did. Before the end of the week, she, she sent me an email to testify and say, God moved, something's happened, something's changed in her situation, in her circumstances. All right? And so if you don't know the love of God and you've never called him Lord, I want to pray with you today. You're watching me. Maybe you just drifted by. Not a lot of people watch the program, but they don't comment. And if you are one of those people you've been watching and you don't know, maybe you don't fully understand everything I've said, it doesn't matter. But if there's something on the inside of you that says, I want to know this love, I want to experience this Love of God on the inside that changes my self-image. Some people, because of their upbringings and things that they've been through as children, maybe you've not had the love of a father, 
or the love of a mother so you don't really know what it is to be truly loved why don't you let the Lord Jesus love you today why don't you let the Lord Jesus love on you today let's pray these words with me say Lord Jesus I come to you now I come to the throne of heaven I've heard words and I want to respond to them say these words say father would you introduce me to the love of Jesus Christ and in doing so would you wash away all of my sins wash them into the sea of forgetfulness allow me to be a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords allow me to be a believer allow me to be a Christian let me come to you now on a daily basis let me walk in your love I receive the love the forgiveness and the life of Jesus Christ today I am saved if you prayed that prayer then the Spirit of God comes into your life and you now are born again by the Spirit of God and you can start to believe the way I believe and have done for 28 years you can now begin to walk in the presence of God and his love will be a regular feature <coughs> excuse me a daily feature of your life that you can walk in God bless you and keep you as we walk in his love today everyone um, thank you so much for your words and um, messages yeah thank you beautiful amen amen so beautiful thank you Lord for loving us so much truly amazing thank you do you know what I find out about messages about the love of God is that very often women will pick up on messages about the love of God before men do and that is I don't know what it is there's something in us as, as blokes we find it difficult to receive the love of God but if you're a brother and you're watching I want to say this to you this is what we need guys we need to know his love I think there's something something that blocks us it could be something Adamic something going back to Adam the fact that Adam maybe Adam messed up you know it wasn't Adam that ate the fruit first but it was Adam who carried the responsibility come on now so is it possible that in the man there's still a veil there let me say that again it wasn't that man that ate, ate first but when the woman gave to the man the man ate and so I believe is it possible that there's a veil that's on men so we're just unable many times to just receive that love and then very often because we're blokes you know we, we, we are more resistant to you know we don't hug we don't say we love we don't you know we're, we're blokes but this is key for us as men of God to receive and understand the love of God it will transform our lives and actually it will make us the men we really want to be because you want to be that man whose hands are anointed by God you want to be that man who can speak and pray for people and see them delivered you want to be that man that's the man you want to be you want to be the one who has victory over the devil my hands are burning hot right now something going on as I'm praying for somebody somebody's being touched you want to be that man but you ain't going to get there in your own power or in your own strength see men are strong but you won't be that man in your own strength you can only be that man in his strength and through his love well bless you everybody I want to say good morning and thank you to all of you who have um, you're in Brazil shalom to you Gina Priscilla's in Brazil wow enjoy that um, yeah the blockage is Satan Anna it's true absolutely true and uh, God bless you those of you who um, 
yeah, let us allow the Holy Spirit uh, to give us the words needed to proclaim our love for our Creator and Father and trust that when He does, we are able to share. Amen. Amen. I think there was a message from my friend, the Bishop uh, Buchanan. Are you there? I don't know where is it? Sure, I saw a message from you. Oh, I like that. A Jennifer says, Lord, be a fence around me every day. I pray that I stay in the center of you. I am, in the, I am the righteousness of God. Amen. I live in you and you live in me. Amen. <clears throat> so true. 100% uh, accurate words there. Greater is he who lives in me than he who is in the world. Yeah. God made Moses a God over Pharaoh. That's true. 100% true. Yeah. We are small gods made in the image of God. We are gods of this local realm. Absolutely true. Rosie says, my kingdom is not of this world. Remember, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. <coughs> or rather, we, we wrestle not flesh and blood. Sorry. Um, Kalanet says, thank you, Holy Spirit. I think Kalanet called me cuz the other day. I don't know. Are we related? I saw that. Okay. Um, I saw something somewhere. There he is. Junior Buchanan. Good morning, Doc. Knowing <clears throat> that we are in the world, but not the world, or not of the world. We are in the kingdom of light to which all power belongs. Bless you, everybody. Thank you so much for <clears throat> your your presence this morning. Next week, hopefully, no, by God's grace, let me get my mind image right. Next week, I will be back in the studio. <clears throat> Next week, the studio will be in the UK. It should arrive tomorrow. Thank you all of you for your help <clears throat> in helping me get it over here. It will arrive. I will be well. And next week, the broadcast will go back to normal. <clears throat> and I won't be just sitting here in front of my laptop with a bit of a slightly dodgy picture. I look forward to that. I look forward to being with you all next week. I feel like the Lord is moving me into a new teaching. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be, but I know next week there'll be something exciting. The Word of God will come forward. <clears throat> and of course, we're going to be starting uh, some new programming, which I'll be telling you about soon. So God bless you. Have a great, great, great day and walk in that knowledge. Be transformed by your image, the image of Christ that is on the inside of you. Be transformed by that image every single day. In Jesus' name, love you with the love of the Lord. You're the, you couldn't be loved any more than you are loved right now. Not only by Jesus, but also by me. Love you all with the love of the Lord. God bless you until I see you again. It's me. Dr. Hugh Alexander Jackman saying, have a great day. God bless you. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. In his new book, Anointer, Anointing, Anointed, God, the Holy Spirit, and you. Dr. Hugh Alexander Jackman unpacks the true and hidden meaning of the title, The Christ. Each rich chapter of this book will build your faith and confidence in the Word of God, Jesus, and His anointing. The message is for all who will hear the Word. Through a detailed and thought-provoking exegesis of the revelation of the Christ. Anointer, anointing, anointed, God. The Holy Spirit and you is available now through Amazon Worldwide or directly by contacting Hugh Jackman Publishing at spiritandlife.org.uk. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Anointer, anointing, anointed. God, the Holy Spirit, and you.
Hello everyone, I'm Hugh Alexander Jackman and I am the author of this book, Jesus the Aleph Tav. You know, I'm inviting you to come and get into this study with me. These are 22 incredible stanzas. Together, as we read, we will unlock some mysteries and hidden truths that have been hidden away for thousands of years in the writing of King David. I mean, this is so exciting. And you can get your copy right now on Amazon. You can get it on paperback. You can get it as an ebook. And if you want to, that's in the Kindle store. And if you want to, you can even get it as an audio book. So there's nothing stopping you from joining me for this life-changing study. I pray that you get a hold of this book and that we'll dig into this wonderful study together. everyone it's Hugh saying thanks for stopping by and hope you enjoyed that if you did please leave a comment and put a like on it now if you like that one you'll probably like one of these two but before you go off and watch that why don't you hit the subscribe button so you'll always know when we've got new programs coming out god bless you